Okay, good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me clearly, you can see the screen also clearly. Yes, sir, good morning. Yes, sir, good morning, sir. Very good morning. Yes, happy New Year good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning, happy New Year to everyone. Hope you enjoyed your New Year yesterday. And uh, then now we can get down to our normal duties, okay? And that is trying to get your ETO, COC, as soon as possible. Okay, so on Saturday, we had made a start on this special electrical requirements on board oil, gas, and chemical tankers. Now, this is almost a certain question if you are a tanker guy, whether you have been on oil, gas, or chemical tanker. Not so much for those on bulk carriers or containers. But then you do carry dangerous cargo in the form of coal on bulk carriers that emits methane. And that is a hydrocarbon gas, a highly explosive gas. I gave you the example of what happened on one of the Bergeson bulk carriers. Of course, Bergeson today is no longer there. It's taken over by another company. Okay. <laughs> also, one of those container vessels, I do not know which company it belonged to, but there was one container vessel which is lost off the coast of Colombo. Okay, because one or two containers was carrying dangerous cargo, they caught fire and then the fire spread. Okay, they could not contain the fire. So ultimately, the ship sank. Okay, so whatever it is, on your bulk carriers and container vessels, you don't require these special electrical fitments. But most certainly on oil, gas and chemical tankers, the very reason is because of this particular diagram. I told you to take a screenshot that day. If those have not taken a screenshot, please do so now. Everything forward of the accommodation up to a certain height in your pump rooms. <coughs> okay, these will be on oil and chemical tankers. But on gas carriers, you don't have a pump room. Somewhere around midship area, you have what is called as the compressor room. Remember, as I said, your gas is carried in a liquefied form and therefore you require those huge compressors to keep it in the liquefied uh, form. In other words, Keep that particular pressure of the cargo so that the cargo remains in the liquefied form rather than it gasifying. If it gasifies, you have to release the gas. Very rarely you have uh, re-liquefication plants. Those are very, very expensive. And to re-liquefy the gas is even more expensive. So usually what is done is whatever the gas that... Uh, I mean, whatever the cargo that turns back into the gas, usually that gas is taken and is burnt in your main engine. Not all the ships, but quite a few ships do that. Okay. In other words, it's going to be a loss for the uh, consign. Okay. And that is all part and parcel of the charter party. Okay. That is not a concern. But what is our concern is now within all these red areas, there are most certainly going to be some electrical fittings, such as on our gas carriers, as I said, you will be having motors on top of each of the cargo tanks. The cargo are going to be driving the cargo pumps well below into the tanks. But these motors are going to be provided with electricity, with voltage, with current, right in the middle of this red zone. And therefore, they have to be specifically guaranteed that they are not going to cause a fire and explosion. Likewise, lights also. Okay? Right. So, with that, the bottom line is to prevent a fire and explosion. Okay? See my, give me a moment. My...
Okay, so end of the day, we have to prevent a fire and explosion. Okay, we saw from that particular diagram what are the dangerous or hazardous areas. Okay, and that's a place where we need to fit some electrical fittings. And if electrical fittings are to be fitted in those areas, then they should be adequately protected so as to avoid this. Okay. So as to avoid a fire and explosion. Okay, because you know there can be a fault sometimes in the electrical equipment. If there is a fault, heat can be produced, sparks can be produced, okay? And all that can go up to making the third side of that fire triangle, the heat component, oh, the ignition component. <coughs> Okay, so now on these tankers, tankers are segregated, at least on board each tanker, they are segregated into zones. Zone 0, zone 1, zone 2. Zone 0 is an area where you will be having this flammable gas. Whatever the flammable gas is, that flammable gas is acting as one side of that triangle, fire triangle, in other words, fuel. On your tanker, you have sufficient amount of O2, for example, on the deck over here. Okay, sufficient amount of O2. Okay. And of course, you need the third part, which is the ignition source. Okay. <coughs> So that ignition source can be any one of those electrical fittings such as lights, your tube lights over there, your motors, whatever other electrical fittings that might be there. Okay. So when this particular gas is available throughout, whether loading or discharging operations or even after that, if it is there, in other words, there for very long periods of time, 24-7, 365 days of the year, such an area is called zone 0. For example, which are zone 0 over here in this particular thing. Your pump room is a zone 0. Inside your cargo tanks will be zone 0. Okay, very near to any opening such as your PV valves and all that, they will be zone 0. By your manifold, especially when you're loading and discharging, zone zero. Okay. In other words, any electrical fitting in those particular areas have to be protected adequately. Okay. Zone two or zone one, where they would be normally present during cargo operation. This particular flammable gas that would be normally present only during cargo operations. Okay, so that would be definitely at your manifold, cargo manifold. Okay, otherwise over here this will be zone zero, but on the deck, we are talking now on the deck where once the ship is moving after her loading or discharging operations, then you're going to be having a free flow of air over here. And it's going to be blowing away the uh, hydrocarbon or the flammable gas. Okay, how close to those openings that might be there, you are going to be taking a call on that. And that particular thing is about 2.4 meters from those openings. As far as this is concerned, on the deck, from the deck, 2.4 meters. I gave you the example of the forward life raft the portable uh, embarkation light that is there, that need not be uh, intrinsically safe. Okay? An intrinsically safe light fitting is very expensive. Your normal light fitting is uh, probably one-fourth or even less uh, cost than that. 
Okay, so as I told you, in case there is any inspector, PSC or vetting or whatever, sometimes they query you as this. They de deliberately query you this and say, why is this not intrinsically safe? You should be capable of giving the answer. Normally, the superintendent, attending superintendent gives the answer. But if he keeps uh, pummeling you, then you can say that 2.4 meters from any openings is considered safe because you are in zone number one. Okay? You are not going to be having uh, hydrocarbon gas over there and because the ship is uh, in motion. And you are going to be quite clear of that uh, area. Zone 2, where flammable gas mixture may not be present even during cargo operation. And even if it is, then they will be there for very short periods of time before it is dissipated. Open decks, open spaces on deck. Where are they? Over here. I gave you examples. Your floodlights over here on your bridge. The floodlights on your uh, midship mast. The floodlights that are here on your Foxel mast, O mast. Okay? They are well. You are going to be having all your lights on, isn't it? During your cargo operations. All these lights. And those light fittings are all normal light fittings. They are not uh, explosion proof rated uh, light fittings. Okay? I'm pretty certain you have gone up and changed one of those lights during uh, before uh, arrival port or after departure port. You would have definitely changed. And they are pure normal light fittings. They are not specific uh, specific uh, light fittings as far as explosion proof etc. is concerned. Okay. So that will be this area here, zone 2. Above this zone 2, this particular forward mass light is zone 2. Okay. Right. And of course, all the other white areas, your uh, engine room blowers are working. They are going to be pushing in some of that uh, uh, flammable gas, but your engine room is not a, a dangerous area, despite some of that gas coming in. Okay? So, that is why these will be all zone 2. All the white areas, and they are normally safe areas. Okay? Right. So, that's where we stopped yesterday. I hope you have taken a screenshot of this. Uh, not yesterday, on Saturday. Okay? Okay, and now we will continue further with this particular thing. Okay, I hope you've taken a screenshot with the notes. I, last time I told you to take only of the thing, but take the notes, uh, which is just above that. Okay. Right. So we spoke about the fire triangle. Let me zoom out a bit so as to get both in. Yeah, you can take a screenshot of this. We are doing a little bit of backtracking over here. When I say backtracking, we were talking about all this when we did the Portable gas detection equipment. We spoke about the fire triangle. So any one of these is missing. If O2 is missing, if fuel is missing, or the ignition source is missing, you are not going to have a fire and explosion. Any one of these is missing. And then again, later on, we'll be seeing in this chapter that we need a sufficient amount a sufficient amount of ignition source, a sufficient amount of fuel, and a sufficient amount of O2. If there is O2 but very deficient, like as you uh, as we saw, especially those on board tankers will know, we are having an O2 analyzer to see how much of O2 is going into the <coughs> cargo tanks together with the IG. It consists 5% of O2. Still, we are not going to have a fire next. Okay, there is O2, but you have to have sufficient of O2. Likewise, you have to have sufficient of fuel and likewise, you have to have sufficient ignition source. 
so that when they all three come together, then you will have a final star. Otherwise, still you're not going to have a final star. Okay, we also saw what is LEL, LFL, HFL, HEL. Also, this is called as UFL, upper flammable limit and upper explosive limit. UEL, UFL. All mean one and the same. LFL, LEL, lower flammable limit, lower explosive limit. And as per, if you have taken a screenshot of this, we will also see that... Uh, uh, flammability curve whereby we saw what is LEL or LFL okay and it is the lowest concentration of that explosive gas okay the lowest concentration of this explosive gas okay it's lying on this curve and this curve is the flammable region not reason <coughs> okay and since it's lying on this curve, it has sufficient amount of O2. If you're going to draw a straight line from point C down to the x-axis, of course, this is point A will be 20.9, approximately 21% of O2. Okay, so you can see that point C, if you're going to take it against the x-axis, is going to be at least 20.5, 20.6% of O2. Plentiful of O2. Okay. And if you remember from that particular uh, chapter that we spoke of, just give me a moment. Okay, so if you remember what we saw about this line AB when we were doing the portable gas detection equipment was that this line AB was a mixture of that flammable gas and O2. Okay, so you have enough of that fuel, that hydrocarbon gas, that flammable gas. Okay, so you have already two sides of the triangle and all that you're waiting for is that ignition source. And here, if you're going to provide that ignition source, you're definitely going to have a fire and explosion. Okay, so that is the lowest concentration of this gas because point C is lying on this line AB, isn't it? Okay, so all that it requires is that ignition source and then you will have your fire, uh, fire and explosion. Okay, so that is the lower flammable limit or lower explosive limit. Corresponding to that, you have your highest concentration of the gas. HFL, HEL, or UFL, UEL, all mean one and the same thing as I said. And that is going to be this point, point D, the highest concentration of this gas. Okay? Because if you are going to go anywhere above that, then you are going to go into too rich an atmosphere where one side of the triangle will be missing and that is the O2 side. Okay, because as you're going to go up above D, you're going towards B. And that will be about, say, 18-19% of uh, O2. Yes, sufficient of O2. But when you're going to have this concentration of the gas, the concentration of this gas is going to literally swamp this particular O2. So, you're going to be missing one side of the triangle. And then no matter what the ignition source, you're not going to have a fire and explosion. Okay, being that too rich an atmosphere. So, but at this particular place, you have sufficient of that O2. You have sufficient of that uh, particular uh, amount of gas, flammable gas. And all that it is waiting for is an ignition source. So, it is the highest concentration of the gas in air. Okay, because as I said, at point D, if you're going to draw a line down, it will be about 18-19% of O2. And that is sufficient of O2 still. Okay? And that will cause a fine explosion when there is a ignition source. Okay? So, that was LEL, HEL. <laughs> okay.
Okay. You can take a screenshot of this if you so wish. We had discussed it in the portable gas detection equipment. You can keep this for this particular chapter. And we'll be discussing this once again when we are going to be doing the portable gas detection equipment. Okay. Yes. Right. So, what did I say with regards to this triangle, the far higher triangle? I said there should be sufficient of fuel, sufficient of O2, and sufficient of heat. Now, what? How do you know sufficient heat? And that sufficient heat is known as the minimum ignition energy. Okay. Or min minimum ignition level with regard to the ignition source. And what is the definition? It is the minimum amount of energy that is required to ignite a combustible vapor or gas or dust cloud, for example, by means of an electrostatic discharge. So even an electro electrostatic energy, whenever that is going to be discharged, that spark, even though that spark is so little, so light, that has sufficient energy the minimum ignition energy that can cause a fire and explosion. Okay, so the third part of the triangle, as I said, the minimum amount of ignition source is this, the minimum ignition energy level. Okay. What is auto ignition temperature? Also called the kindling point. These are all definitions that you have to know because then they can cross-question you with regard to these in your oral. So, what is auto-ignition temperature? Auto-ignition temperature or kindling point of a substance is the lowest temperature at which it will spontaneously ignite. This is the punchline, spontaneous ignition. Okay, in a normal atmosphere without an external source of ignition. Okay, so what does this mean? If you can't uh, remember these big words, spontaneous ignition. Spontaneous ignition means to light without any assistance, to for it to catch fire without any assistance. Now, we are very knowledgeable of the fact that when you have sufficient of flammable gas, sufficient of O2, you light a matchstick and then you can go kaboom. Okay, you will have a fire and explosion. Okay, some days lit a matchstick uh, or lit a cigarette and thrown a butt into some oily rags or something like that. Yes, it is going to catch fire. But for it to catch fire without such assistance, without such external existence, uh, assistance, that is called as spontaneous ignition. Now to drive home this point of spontaneous ignition, I'll tell you about a instance that happened on my very old ship. It was a tanker. We had gone to Japan discharge and on route, we were told we had to go to Vietnam. <coughs> Those who have been to Vietnam will know that there is, I forget the name of the river, but there is a pilot point right at the mouth over there. Those who are having smaller tankers would have definitely gone down that river, but bigger tankers cannot. Okay, ours was a Aframax tanker. So Aframax tankers are too big to go down the river. Therefore, we are we were supposed to 
pick up a cargo from an FPSO, floating production and offtake. Okay, so we were supposed to berth on arrival and start loading. However, en route, there was a severe cyclone which they had predicted to curve, instead went right across the Philippines and into Vietnam. So there was a big backlog of ships. <coughs> and instead of berthing on arrival, we had to come and anchor. And I think the anchor was about for six, seven days. Quite, quite a long anchorage we had. Okay, so after the, there's a calm before the storm and there's a calm after the storm also. So we had mirror like, uh, I mean, uh, swimming pool like conditions. And the sun was blazing down onto the deck. Also on route from Japan to this thing, the engineers did a decarb of one of the generators. Okay, and whenever you do a decarb, the engineers know that you're going to be creating a lot of oily rags. Okay, our ship was such that our engine room was not having any spare space to keep all these oily rags. So, second engineer told the fitter just all these old oil drums, just uh, fashion them such that we can put our oily rags in that and then burn it in the incinerator at some point in time. So about four or five uh, oil drums were filled, three of which we could keep it in the engine room. Two were kept on the poop deck. Okay, so I'm just going to draw very roughly over here. Okay, if this was the accommodation, this is your funnel deck. Okay, they had uh, tied up, put it on a particular uh, wooden crates and secured it. Okay, with the covers also. Now, we were supposed to have some inspection and uh, at Japan, when the superintendent came on board it was a japanese company superintendent came on board and said uh, told the chief officer since we're having an inspection also he had already painted all the forward section all from aft over here to the poop deck everything was yet very shoddy okay so he said since the inspector is going to be coming you've got anchorage <laughs> finish off this painting so that uh, the inspector gets a good impression. Okay, so what did the crew do? The crew did. They, aren't, uh, they were going to concentrate on this area first, the poop deck. So they undid this and took and put the uh, things over here. Okay, so it was taken off from the poop side, the aft side had come and connected here. Two of those drums. In the bargain, the crew, the deck crew, they forgot to put those wooden uh, crates underneath. And also, they removed the covers of these. Okay, see the carelessness. Now, with the sun beating down very heavily, and the sun was beating down, and this was the starboard side. The sun was beating down very heavily. <laughs> on the starboard side and the deck was really hot okay really hot so that means the heat was transferred also to the those oil drums plus the sun was beating down onto the particular oily rags because they have not uh, closed the cover okay and suddenly this was uh, around 10 o'clock where we normally break off for chai and go for chai uh, the manual fire alarm was sounded. Okay, manually, not it was not even the automatic. System. So we were just wondering, like, are ye captain sab ne kya kar rahe? Chai ka time ho gaya and he's having fire drill. So I was busy. There was something on the main engine uh, thing. I was uh, doing some work over there, and I went up to the engine uh, ECR, and I, I saw Badasab uh, talking on the phone. Obviously, he was talking with the bridge. 
एंड देन ही टोल्ड मी बती साहब जरा जाके देख लो कि दिस इज रियल फायर इज नॉट ए ड्रिल now normally we are all are supposed to hear whether it's a drill or not a drill we are all supposed to go and muster isn't it anyway i came up onto the deck i went from the port side because i went through the engine room via the ig platform and out onto the port side of the ship i saw nothing over there i came aft nothing over here but when i came to the starboard side i saw these two things were on fire okay no nobody had lit in a match and thrown it nobody is going to be stupid enough to do that nobody had lit a cigarette and thrown it over there nobody had done anything but yet it caught fire it caught fire because it had got heated up by the sun the drum also was quite hot okay so that is what is meant of spontaneous ignition for this to catch fire without any external source such as flame or cigarette butt or anything it caught fire by itself that is what is meant as spontaneous ignition or the temperature at which it catches fire spontaneously that would be called the auto ignition temperature okay everybody is clear with that yes sir right so i'll just adjust this you can take a screenshot just give me a moment let me okay now you can take a screenshot what is minimum ignition energy what is auto ignition temperature so therefore if we are going to have a fire and explosion we do not need any things that are going to be causing that particular triangle to be complete <coughs> and one of those things is the ignition source the ignition source as you can see these five points can be arcing between switch contacts can be arcing between a live conductor and earth okay that is why in our battery locker we are having a explosion proof rated light fitting why is because due to vibration or something one of those live conductors can come out and can short with the metal portion and can cause sparks to be emitted if it was not a explosion proof rated light fitting those sparks could have lit up the hydrogen as i said one of the by products of your uh, charging of your lead acid batteries is hydrogen gas which is quite an explosive gas okay so arcing between a live conductor and earth is one possibility the third possibility is an internal arcing fault within an electrical enclosure now how many times we have heard of you know motor winding shorting inside and then you know an ordinary motor what is the final uh, this thing of that motor that motor could be blown to smithereens depending on the size of it number 4 overheating of electrical equipment in a dangerous area now i spoke about your cargo pump motors or especially on board your gas tankers any motor that is going to be running will be running at a certain temperature no the shell temperature okay so that temperature of that particular motor shell can cause your gas that is surrounding that particular motor to be ignited okay under normal circumstances is going to be uh, creating a certain amount of heat under abnormal circumstances of the motor such as 
shorting of the motor, etc., that can draw a higher amount of current and therefore have create even extra uh, heat, isn't it? And that extra heat can cause a fire and explosion. Okay, and last but not least, your electrostatic spark. As I said, that is a very, very tiny spark, but that energy that is there in that spark has more than enough minimum ignition level or minimum ignition energy to form the third side of that fire triangle and you will have a fire and explosion. Okay. So if you're taking a screenshot of this, we will now see how we will safeguard any of these equipments from causing a fire and explosion. Right. Okay. Okay, please take a screenshot of this. Where we will be seeing what is this temperature, the shell temperature, the casing temperature of any electrical equipment that is working will have a certain temperature at which it is going to be working at. When it is off, it's not it's going to be as cool as the ambient temperature but when it is working it will generate some amount of heat okay and therefore we have to see which industry we are concerned with the industries that are going to be concerned with this explosive nature of hydrocarbon gases or any other flammable gases, they are going to be sent into two groups, group one and group two. Group one is only your mining industry. And therefore, our ship is not a mining industry. And therefore, we can safely disregard this group. <coughs> we are definitely in this group. Group 2, which says other industries and other industries includes shipping. Okay. So definitely, we will fall under group 2. Now, if you remember, when we were speaking about that particular uh, light fitting in your battery locker, we said EXI Roman letter 2C. Okay, that's one of the very basic this things. You might be having extra. Uh, this thing. Okay, so let's see. I'm drawing it very, uh, this thing over here. Okay, normally it is that tubular type of uh, fitting, tube light fitting. One side is sealed over here. But the other side has a duckan, isn't it? A cover that is screwed in. The screws, the screw threads of this cover as it is screwed in is very fine. Okay, very fine. And also the gap between these is also very, very fine. That's why it takes almost quite some time to unscrew it and then screw it back into place. Okay. When it is screwed back into place, normally there is a metal thing over here. And to that metal thing, you're going to be having one sort of a special Allen key like thing. Allen key would be generally square type or uh, I'm not talking, it's not an exact Allen key, but we call it an Allen key because it's 
it looks like an allen key but has having different shape okay so one would be probably hexagonal okay there are other shapes also okay so these are the most common types that will be able to be put into this and then you lock it into place so that by vibrations or anything this particular dakkan or cover does not get loosened okay now the gap the gap that is here between the cover and the main body of your tube light fitting that could be a b or c okay the gap between this cover and the main tube light fitting can be a b or c okay remember two is with regard to shipping and we fall under that now we want to see what particular light fitting if you remember that thing was e x i to c and somebody had asked me what is this 2c mean so we already know what this 2 is okay it is a certain group with regard to shipping or any other industry now we have to see what the c means first let's start with a this gap that i spoke about if it is greater than 0.9 mm that means these threads <laughs> Sorry about that. I got a bit thing in my throat. Okay, so this particular gap. would be having greater than 0.9 mm between this and the gap that means these threads and all would be more further apart from each other <laughs> if it is b then this gap this gap is going to be less between 0.5 and 0.9 mm <laughs> and then if it's going to be c then this gap also the thread gap is going to be less than 0.5 mm okay so now we know what this 2c means 2 over here means we are belonging to group 2 and c means that the gap between this dakkan and the tube light fitting is less than 0.5 mm and this is going to prevent any problem inside this particular thing if there is a spark or an explosion or anything then that energy must be dissipated that energy will be dissipated through all these threads and then finally come out through this gap which is less than 0.5 mm by the time that energy comes out of this very tiny gap remember it has to go through all these threads okay that is screwed into this particular thing and then finally come out between this very tiny gap that energy would have dissipated to quite an extent well below the mil minimum ignition energy okay and then if you are going to have that particular energy below your minimum ignition energy level then you are not going to have a fire and explosion you are taking away one side of that fire trunk okay so everybody is understood <coughs> yes sir yes sir understood Okay, good. 
Right. So continuing with this temperature business. Okay. We have seen what is 2C. Now let's see with regard to any electrical fittings that are going to be fitted right in the middle of that explosive region. Okay. And that is called as the temperature classes. Ignition temperature. This is a general temperature. Okay, is the lowest heated temperature of a surface at which a flammable gas can ignite. Okay, so please take a screenshot of this. Okay, so you are going to heat up a certain thing. Maybe because of a explosion inside of a motor or a short circuit inside of a motor, or just that the motor bearings are gone, therefore it's drawing more current, therefore that particular motor is going to get heated up. Okay, and remember, now this motor is going to be fitted right in the middle of those flammable gases. So obviously, a flammable gas will have its ignition temperature. And if that ignition temperature is reached because of this faulty motor, then most certainly you are going to have a fire and explosion. Therefore, for example, now we have taken motors. So let's stick to the motors. Okay. Even if those motors are going to get a fault. Okay. Under normal circumstances, they are going to generate a certain amount of heat. But even if there is a fault, then the heat so generated by that motor should still not ignite that particular flammable gas. For which they are given a certain temperature rating. Who is given a certain temperature rating? The motor. Okay, and that we will see in the temperature classes where bigger the T number lower is that temperature at which that particular gas will be ignited. Okay. So if you're taking a screenshot, we'll go forward. Okay. So let's see these temperature classes here. Very important table, gentlemen. Okay, because in the orals, they can ask you something like this. Okay. P, X, I, A. Okay, T, 6, Roman letter 2, C. For example. Okay, there's the even more complicated than this also. So suppose the examiner has given you this. Okay, and he tells you, please tell me what this means. Now, <coughs> if you cannot explain to him, guys, I can guarantee you, you will fail because this is a safety related topic. And a very pertinent safety related topic. Okay. So let's see what this temperature table tells you about. Remember we said greater the T number. This is the T number. You can see the T number is small which is 1 here. The temperature is higher. Whereas when the T number is increased and here the T number is 6 compared to 1, 6 is more. So greater the T number, lower is the ignition temperature. And the temperature of that particular equipment that can be reached even if there is a fault condition. Okay. So greater the T number, lower is that particular temperature. The ignition temperature. <clears throat> right. 
So, as I said, you need to concentrate on these three columns. How do you memorize this is up to you. But I will give you a few tips. If you have an easier way of me uh, memorizing it, fine. Don't just neglect this for the time. We don't require this at all. Okay. Okay. So let's take this. Okay, I'll give you, as I'm going about it, I will give you tips on how to try and memorize this. <coughs> this is quite easy to memorize and this is quite easy to memorize. So you will have to somehow the other memorize this thing. The middle column. Three columns. Column one is quite easy to memorize. Column two is quite easy to memorize. You will have to somehow or the other memorize the middle column. Once you memorize this middle column, everything will fall into place like a jigsaw puzzle, which is very, very simple. So let's start with the smallest T number. T1, and since we are talking about uh, the surface temperature of a motor, we'll stick to motors. The maximum surface temperature of that motor should not exceed 450 degrees centigrade. Whether normal or abnormal conditions. Okay, remember whenever you're going to be having some uh, bearing trouble, then the temperature is going to draw much more current, no? So let's say that particular motor is having some problem with its bearings, the temperature has risen. That temperature should not exceed 450 degrees centigrade. Okay. Provided that the gas that is surrounding that particular motor, its ignition temperature is greater than this temperature. Okay. Fault conditions or no fault conditions, the temperature of this particular motor, the casing of this uh, motor should not exceed 450 degrees centigrade, provided the ignition temperature of that gas is greater than. You cannot have equal to. If it was equal to, then definitely you'll have fire and explosion. So, how do you memorize this? These two columns. Starting with this column. I've only given you this example of T1. Starting with this column. Put T1 right at the top. T6 right at the bottom. Then from T1 you proceed to T2. Then T2 has four divisions. <coughs> A, B, C and D. So T2A, T2B, T2C, T2D. After T to D, then you have T3. And T3 has three subdivisions, T3A, T3B, T3C. Then you have T4. T4 has only one subdivision and that is T4A. And then directly T5 and T6. Not too much two things. Remember, 2 has 4 subdivisions apart from T2. T3 has three subdivisions apart from T3 itself. T4 has only one subdivision and T5 and T6 follow by themselves. And again T1 and T2 don't have any subdivisions. So I think that is easy enough to memorize. This as I said you have to memorize. Now, how does one memorize this particular column? You said the maximum surface temperature should not exceed 450 degrees, provided that the gas that is surrounding it is greater than this. So you take this figure, put it in this column, and put the greater two side. Okay, then proceeding to T2. T2, 300 degrees centigrade is the maximum surface temperature of that particular motor 
in good or abnormal conditions, it should not exceed 300 degrees centigrade. Provided the gas surrounding it has an ignition temperature greater than this. <coughs> so, bring this over here, put the greater to side, like as we did over here, we brought it across, put the greater to side. So, greater than this, but less than this one. So, you bring this down and put the less than or equal to side. Here, you don't forget, you cannot put the equal to sign. If you put the equal to sign, you are wrong. But here, less than or equal to 450, you are still above this, above 300 degrees. So, it is safe enough. Okay, so you take this across and then bring this down. T2A, 280 degrees centigrade is the surface, maximum surface temperature of that particular motor provided the ignition temperature of that gas is greater than this. So, you take this across, put the greater to the side, and then less than or equal to what? This particular number. So, you bring that down, put the less than or equal to number. Okay? T2B, 260, provided that the ignition temperature of the gas is greater than 260, but less than or equal to, bring this one down here and put the less than or equal to side. So, can you see a pattern that is fall, being followed and how to memorize the third column? T to D. Okay, T to D. Oh, sorry, T to C. 230 degrees centigrade provided. You bring this across here, put the greater to side. And less than or equal to this one. Bring that down. Less than or equal to 260 degrees centigrade. Likewise, T2D, 215 degrees centigrade, provided the gas that is surrounding it is greater than this, but less than or equal to this one. So, bring this down. Okay? Then you move to T3. T3, maximum surface temperature that can be reached by that particular motor. <coughs> should not exceed 200 degrees. So then, provided that your gas is going to be having an ignition temperature greater than this. So you bring this across here, put the greater to the side. But here, there is a difference. Less than or equal to what? From T3 go directly to T2, which is 300 degrees centigrade. Okay? This and this. So, you bring this 300 down there, greater than or equal to 300, uh, sorry, less than or equal to 300 degrees centigrade. Then T3A, 180 degrees centigrade, maximum surface temperature of that particular motor, provided the gas that is surrounding it has a temperature, ignition temperature greater than this. So, you bring this across, put the greater to side but less than or equal to this one, 200 degrees centigrade. So, we bring that 200 down, less than or equal to sine over T3B, 165 degrees centigrade, provided the gas surrounding it has an ignition temperature greater than 165, but less than or equal to, bring this down here, 180. T3Z, 160 degrees centigrade, provided that the ignition temperature is greater than this. So, take this across, put the greater to the side. <coughs> what less than or equal to 165? Bring this down. Then you are coming to T4. Okay. 135 degrees centigrade. So, obviously, the temperature of that the ignition temperature should be greater than this. So, bring, bring this across. And then, again, there is a difference. Less than or equal to T3. T3 was less than or equal to T2. Just give me a moment.
Okay, so you saw that T3 was taking T2's figure over here. T4 was taking T3's figure over here. Okay. Then you have T4A, 120 degrees centigrade, provided the ignition temperature is greater than or equal to 120. You bring this across, put the greater to side. But less than or equal, you're back to the normal, this thing, 135 degrees centigrade. Then you're coming to T5. If T4 is taking this and T3 is taking this, then obviously T5 is going to take this. Okay, so greater than, you bring this across, less than or equal to, as you saw, 135. Okay. And T6 again, bring this across here and again take from T5. Okay, so T6 has taken T5, T5 is taken T4, T4 is taken T3 and T3 is taken T2 with regard to the figure on the right hand side here. Okay, so I've given you some way of trying to memorize this. The main thing is you have to memorize this. Okay, these two just fall into place very easily once you know this. Okay. Everybody's taking a screenshot of your temperature class. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, good. So if you have, okay, if you have any other easier method of trying to memorize this, then please do so. But I'm pretty certain the way that I showed you just now should be good enough for you to easily memorize this, okay? Right, so moving forward. Okay, you can take a screenshot of this. <coughs> so we saw that electrical fitting or fittings, wherever it is required, has to be fitted in those particular flammable gas areas and therefore have to be adequately protected so as to avoid a fire and explosion under normal circumstances or even under abnormal circumstances. So they must comply with the general requirements of EN60079. Okay. And by this particular thing, they will be all having this particular rating. EX followed by some letter and we will see what those, those particular letters are good. But just the word EX means it is explosion proof rated. It can be fitted in that particular red zone that we saw. All those areas that are colored red, they can be fitted in that particular zone, but depends on what is the letter following the word or following the letters EX. <coughs> okay, right. So these are the letters that are following the letters EX. EX standing for explosion proof. Please take a screenshot of this because they ask you in the orals, what are the different types of explosion proof protection that you have? What are the different types of explosion proof protection that you have on board your anchors? 
These are the nine explosion proof ratings that we have. Number one, EXD. EXD stands for flame proof enclosure. We will also see a video on this. EXI is explosion proof rated with respect to intrinsic safety. Again, we will be seeing a video on this. EXE increased safety. EXN with regards to equipment that don't produce sparks. Remember, a spark can be an ignition source. EXM encapsulation. EXQ sand fill, just like you have fuses that are have, having uh, things slow blow fuses, no? Okay, you are going to have sand to help quench that particular spark that is created. EXO oil immersed explosion proof rating. EXP pressurized enclosure. And finally, EXS, a special type of explosion proof rating. Okay, we will be taking each one of these nine. But for your information, the cross questions that are related to you will be the first three. They will cross question you a lot. Okay, they will cross question you a lot with regard to these first three. Not to say that they cannot cross question you with the rest, but as I said, they will concentrate, concentrate on EXD, EXI and EXE. Right, so let's take EXD. Flame proof enclosure. So suppose a particular thing needs to be fit in, fitted. Okay, we I will not uh, ask you to take a screenshot of this because this one, the videos and the thing over here, the notes are more than adequate. Okay. If a certain fitting has to be fitted right next to a place that is emitting this flammable gas, say one of those motors or one of those light fittings, okay, such a flame proof light fitting or motor would be given an EXD rating, a flame proof rating. And for that equipment to be given this particular rating, EXD rating, then they must fulfill these conditions, three conditions. Number one, enclosure should be strong enough to withstand any internal explosion without suffering any damage. Okay. An internal explosion when do you have an external, internal explosion? Mostly whenever the two windings are shorting, no? Usually you find that's the case. Or something else has caused those windings to get damaged. 440 is shorting with 440. You will definitely have an internal uh, explosion. Without suffering any damage. <coughs> What do they mean by without suffering any damage? <laughs> that means, let's say, you have these motors and I'm talking back again with regard to your gas tankers that have those motors on top of each thing. Let's say one of them has suffered a shorting of uh, two windings. 
an external explosion has occurred. And chief officer called her, hey, uh, just send Bati, uh, Bati Saab up. Uh, I've lost uh, one of those motors. And somebody said when they were there on the deck, they heard a loud explosion. Okay. So you go up gently on your gas tankers. The starter panels of all these motors are generally on the upper deck inside the accommodation. <coughs> Okay, so you go up, you'll find that one of those breakers has stripped. Okay, obviously you don't reset that breaker. You go on deck and see, you see which one of those motors, whichever the breaker is stripped, that'll, that will be motor number one, two, three, four, whatever. So you go to this particular motor on deck and you are going to inspect that motor all round. And you will find as if nothing has happened to that motor. No charring, no uh, breakage of the, uh, the shell of that particular motor, the casing of that particular motor. Nothing is looking as if it's perfectly normal from the outside. That is what they mean. It is able to withstand an internal explosion so that it does not suffer any external damage. Okay, that is what is point one. So if it meets that criteria, one of those conditions is fulfilled. <coughs> point two, enclosure should prevent heat and gases from escaping into the outside of the enclosure. Okay, so obviously, the motor will be having two sides. One is the load end and one is the free set, free end. So free end, you have nothing coming out, only the shaft where the impeller will be connected, etc. So whatever the gap between the end cover on the free end side, that should be the barest minimum. C, for example, Okay, and also all the oil seals and etc. will be going to be avoiding the minimum amount of this gas from escaping from the free end. Likewise, from the load end as well. Okay, so that is what is your second requirement. So that whatever that explosion occurred on the inside the energy so dissipated by the explosion has to be dissipated. <coughs> okay? But by the time it gets dissipated and comes out into that flammable gas region, it would be cool enough so as to not ignite that flammable gas that is surrounding that motor. And point three, external surface temperature of an enclosure should be maintained lower than the ignition temperature of the gas that may be surrounding it under all operating conditions. That means whether it is operating normally or it had some abnormal things such as this internal explosion. Okay, so whatever the condition of that particular motor at the time of running normally, or at the time of some malfunction to it, the surface temperature of that particular motor should not rise beyond the ignition temperature of the gas that is surrounding. Okay, so it meets all these three conditions, then that motor rating would be finding, if you're going to read the label, it will be having the EXD rating stamped on. Okay, everybody clear with what is EXD? Yes, sir. Okay, let me zoom out a bit so as to because this is part and parcel of EXD, so it's better you take one screenshot of that. Yeah, you can take a screenshot of this.
Okay, so let's see this video with regard to EXT rating. Welcome our competent engineer. Today, we will discuss the design principles of hazardous location equipment and demonstrate how it works. We will then review what needs to be done to ensure the equipment is properly installed and maintained. Enclosures breathe when pressure changes, due to fluctuations in temperature and atmospheric pressure. Flammable gases or vapors in the surrounding area can enter the enclosure through the joints creating an explosive mixture. The design assumes that the explosive mixture of gas or vapor will fill the enclosure. During normal operation, many types of electrical equipment produce arcs or sparks, which have enough energy to ignite gas or vapor in a hazardous location. If it is ignited by the electrical equipment, the enclosure is built to withstand the pressure of the explosion without rupturing and without transmitting the explosion to the surrounding atmosphere through its joints. An enclosure is usually made of a cast metal alloy. The thick walls ensure that the enclosure will withstand the force of an internal explosion. The joints are either threaded or machined flat to create a controlled flame path, which prevents an explosion of the surrounding atmosphere. The metal surfaces absorb and conduct away some of the heat. There is additional cooling of gases as they mix with the cooler atmosphere outside the enclosure. Old hazardous location enclosures are carefully designed to strict standards that include large safety factors. The manufacturing process starts with the pouring of a casting. During machining, particular care is taken to ensure that the joints are flat, smooth, and free from defects. Entries are carefully drilled. and tapped. One flat joints. Entries. and threaded joists. Every design is tested to ensure that it can hold pressure and contain an explosion. An explosion proof window has been installed to allow you to see the explosion inside the enclosure. An explosive gas air mixture is piped in and a spark plug is used to ignite it. This is followed by a water pressure test, in which the enclosure is subjected to a pressure of four times the maximum explosion pressure. Another test is performed to confirm that the joints will prevent an ignition of the surrounding atmosphere. In this test the enclosure is surrounded by an explosive gas mixture inside a plastic tent. Note that the internal explosion is not transmitted to the outside explosive mixture. No, we will deliberately damage the flange joint, to demonstrate what can happen if there is an explosion with a damaged flame path.
to protect the machine joints. Covers must be handled carefully, so that they are not damaged, or dropped. Cleaning the joints, ensures there will be no dirt in the joint, to prevent it from closing properly. A thin layer of grease can be used on a flat joint, to protect against corrosion, and on a threaded joint for corrosion protection, and to guard against binding of the threads. Some joints also contain o-ring seals, to prevent moisture from entering the enclosures when they are used in outdoor locations, make sure they are properly seated. If a joint becomes accidentally painted, or corroded, clean the joint with a solvent, and a clean rag, or attempt to remove the paint or corrosion by filing, or scraping. This could damage the joint. If necessary the enclosure should be sent out for repair, or be replaced. And of course all bolts must be installed, and tightened to maintain strength, and flame path integrity. A good precaution, is to check all flat joints with a feeler gauge, and threaded covers must be fully engaged. Installation and maintenance instructions, are provided with hazardous location equipment. They contain a lot more information, than we've been able to cover now. The instruction sheets and labels on equipment are there to help you. Every time you install or maintain a hazardous location device, remember all the care and attention that went into its design and manufacture. Make sure that you are doing your part to keep it safe. Thank you for your watching. So you saw very clearly this EXD rated uh, enclosure that they had shown. There was, when it is in perfect condition, there was an explosion inside of that equipment. But you saw that nothing had happened on the outside. It was as is, as if nothing had happened on the inside. Okay, if they had not provided that... Uh, window for you to see the explosion you wouldn't have known that there was an explosion inside okay and then you saw that even with that slight scratch that was there that is why they say don't use emery paper or files or anything because then you can create some damage to the flange uh, to the surface okay and then you saw what happened just that slight scratch was more than enough and you had that massive explosion Okay, so that is EXD rated protection. So most of your motors, etc. will be having the EXD rated stamp on their particular name book, okay, or the name plate. Right, so next one is your intrinsically safe circuits, EXI. Okay, you can take a screenshot of this. So EXI rated equipment will be having current and voltage reduced so low okay that your power that is part and parcel a part and parcel of release of energy is also kept low so in an exi rated equipment your current is limited to 50 milliamps <coughs> And your voltage is limited to a maximum of 30 volts. 
So you will be having certain equipment that are going to be going right into the tanks. For example, on your tankers, some cargoes are heated. Okay, they use steam for heating, no worries. But then how are you going to measure the temperature? You are having temperature sensors that are going down right into the lion's den, so to speak. Okay, you're putting it right in the middle of those gases, etc. The flammable gases that are inside the tank. We saw from that figure that the tanks are going to be having those flammable gases 24-7, 365 days of the year until and unless they are going to go to dry dock, whereby your tanks are then gas-free. But till that time happens, your tanks are going to have that flammable gas. And therefore, if you are going to measure the temperature, those temperature sensors will have to be adequately protected. And they are going to be protected by keeping its power low, and by keeping its power low, that means the voltage is to be limited, the current is also to be limited. And the limitation <coughs> for this is 30 volts and 50 milliamps. Okay, so even under fault conditions, say short circuit, Short circuit current is extremely high. Okay, but yet it is going to be limited to 50 milliamps. So we'll see how that is done over here. If some other reason is there that causes the voltage to increase, we will see how that voltage is limited to 30 volts so that it would not create a fire and explosion in the hazardous area. Okay, and for that you have EXIA and EXIB rated equipment. So what is EXIA? EXIA rated equipment is having a safety factor of 1.5 and can operate with two circuit faults. Up to two circuit faults. What are those two circuit faults? We'll see shortly later. Okay. EXIB rated equipment will be also having a safety factor 1.5 but can have only up to one circuit. First and foremost, what is the safety factor that I've written over here and, and highlighted with yellow? That is this. Okay. <coughs> safety factor means that whenever there is a fault, whether it is EXIA or EXIB, we are talking about some fault that is occurring, isn't it? That fault should not cause that particular flammable gas to catch fire. And therefore, whenever these faults are occurring, the energy that is dissipated, whether it's EXIA or EXIB rated, the energy that is dissipated due to those faults, it does not exceed two-thirds the energy under these fault conditions. Two-thirds energy. So you divide three by two, you land up with this magic figure of 1.5. Three divided by two, you get 1.5. And that is your safety factor. Okay, everybody's taking a screenshot of this? Yes, sir. Okay, now let us see how we are going to limit it 
to this very small value of 30 volts, 50 milliamps. We are going to limit it by means of an intrinsically safe barrier. We have heard of this, no? IES barrier. Okay, especially guys on tankers and all that, not uh, guys on uh, bulk carriers or containers. However, this is very important for you also because maybe tomorrow you might be sent on a tanker. You never know. Some emergencies come up, they couldn't find an ETO. They, they said, okay, ye bati sab kafi achha hai. we'll send him on a tanker. He will manage. Okay, so IS barrier is also called as the Zinner barrier. And let's see how it is going to achieve this result. 30 volts, 50 milliamps. <coughs> Okay, you can take a screenshot of this. Let's see below what is there of the Zener barrier. Okay. Okay, just add to this. I'll put it over here and then you can take a screen. Just please. Okay, you can take a screenshot now. But just for that, you'll have to you'll have to scroll down and you'll have to take another screenshot. You take a screenshot of this. Right, so here you're having the hazardous area. That's why it's colored pink. If you remember that uh, flammability region was colored pink, dangerous zone. Okay. And for example, this is your temperature sensor that is located right in that particular hazardous ro uh, region. Okay. It is going to be connected to the equipment back in your particular cargo control room. Your cargo control room is in the non-hazardous area. That means it is inside the accommodation. And inside the accommodation was colored white, if you remember. So that is a non-hazardous area. Here they're giving it a green because no chance of any fire or explosion inside your accommodation until... And unless maybe that gas is coming, but for all practical purposes, this is a non-hazardous. And then the connection of this from this is passed through what is called as the IS barrier or Zener barrier. Right? And now let us see what is this Zena barrier all about. We will take the notes a little later. Just concentrate on this. Right? So take a screenshot. So this here is your accommodation, for example, the CCR, and this here is inside the tank.
Okay, that sensor inside the tank. That's why it's the hazardous area terminals. For this, you need to know that your Zener diode, what are the working characteristics? We are not going to be considering the forward bias because your Zeners, whenever they are connected in circuit, they are going to be reverse bias connected. In other words, if this is positive and this is negative, this Zener diode will be connected in such a way that the cathode is connected to the positive and the anode is connected to the negative. And whenever you are drawing this circuit, friends, do not forget to add this. You have to add this. Okay, the negative terminal is always taken to ground. You have to add this. You don't do this and you've drawn the rest of the circuit, it is still considered as wrong. Okay, do not forget to show the earthing sign. Right, so whenever the Zener is connected in the reverse bias method, we are concerned with this particular part of your Zener graph. Right, so for whatever reasons, <laughs> let's say the voltage over here, it's supposed to be 25, 24 volts DC. Okay. Let's say for some reason, this has gone up to say 50 volts DC. then both these Zeners are going to be 30 volts DC operated. In other words, they have a reverse power characteristic of 30 volts. If 30 volts is re uh, reached, then these Zeners would break down and cause a short circuit. But in causing that short circuit, the current, of course, increases, but the voltage will be clamped to 30 volts. Remember, the voltage from here, for whatever reason, has gone from 24 volts to 50 volts. Okay? That means 50 volts, if these Zeners were not there, then 50 volts would come into this particular thing, and therefore is a potential for a, fi uh, a fire to happen. Okay? So... This <coughs> being an intrinsic safety barrier or Zener barrier is going to limit that particular voltage to 30 volts. So as it is rising, as it is rising towards 50 volts, okay, from zero, rising, 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 it's come to the working voltage of these Zener 1 and Zener 2, the Zener barriers. And those Zener barriers are supposed to break down at 30 volts. The moment 30 volts is reached, the Zener start to conduct. And as you can see, the voltage is not increasing. The voltage is clamped to 30 volts. This has gone up to 50 volts, but these have clamped it to 30 volts. You can see it's not gone anywhere. It's clamped to 30 volts. Okay. Of course, the current is rising. So, we have seen how the Zeners 1 and 2 are doing the job in clamping the voltage to a maximum of 30 volts DC. Okay? Right. So, if the current, as you can see, the current is going to be increasing. If the current is going to increase too much, then of course, because as I said, short circuit current is going to increase. If this one, the current increases too much, then your fuse is going to blow. <coughs> Whereas here, if this one increases too much, then you have your current limiting resistor over here and finally your fuse to safeguard. Okay? So, Apart from this, you are having this resistor as well. And therefore, the current that is going to be passing through your entire circuit at the max 
even if there is a fault over here, that particular sensor has gone faulty, a short circuit and is drawing a maximum current, that maximum current is going to be flowing like this. So first, these two current limiting resistors are going to limit it to a safe value. That safe value is 50 milliamps maximum. And in case the current is going to exceed that, then this particular fuse is going to move. And therefore, you can see how this particular EXI rated equipment will be limiting your voltage to 30 volts DC and 50 milliamps. Okay. Everybody clear over here? Excuse me, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Sir, uh, how can we know that our Zener barrier is in good condition or not? Okay. So, normally on your Zener barrier, okay, wherever it is located, they will be looking like something like this. Okay. So, you have a green LED. See, from manufacturer to manufacturer, it will differ. Okay, the green LED, as I said, always indicates that your power is being supplied. Okay, and then some of them have a very small LED over here. Okay, depending on the number of Zener diodes that are there, th that many indicators you will be having. So, let's say, for example, over here, Zener 1, Zener 2. Okay, normally they will not be lit. Okay, they will normally not be lit. So I'm going to show it like this. So in case one of these zeners, and normally they are going to be uh, also putting a thing over here, Z1, Z2, something like that. So the moment one of them goes, let's say Z2 is gone, then this LED will be lit. That shows you're still being protected by Zena 1. So if this is Zena 1 and Zena 2 is gone, then Zena 1 is still carrying on its job. And you can still operate that particular equipment safely. But if your Zena 1 also goes, then of course, Nothing is passed to the hazardous region. You will have to replace the Zena band. Okay. As I said, from manufacturer to manufacturer, it will be different. So, read up that particular instruction manual with regard to those Zena barriers. You will fi find it in your... Uh, manuals on board and then you see what is what over here okay so this is generally the way you get to know whether your zener barrier is in good condition or not sir is there any other way or like uh, this way is only enough this is one of the ones which i worked on as i said you'll have to look at the manual okay whatever the manual says you can go on the internet and see where is zener barriers and what are the uh, indications of it uh, being bad. Okay, you'll have this, sir, this question is asked by the surveyor. That's why I asked. yeah. So this is one of them. I've practically worked on uh, whatever ships I've had. I've had mostly this. Okay. 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 Other ships I never had problems. So obviously, when you have no problem, you don't look at them, do you? No, sir. Okay. Yeah. So what I suggest is you go online, check all the various types of Zener barriers, see their characteristics, and see what are the Indications, okay? Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah, welcome. Right, so now we spoke about something that says EXIA has two faults, maximum two faults, and EXIB <coughs> maximum one circuit. And this is what I've written here in red. First fault, 
voltage and current increasing. We saw how that particular fault can be kept in check. Voltage increases means your particular zeners would break down and start conducting clamping the voltage. And if your current increases, then you have your current limiting resistors. And if it goes beyond that particular 50 milliamps, then your fuse can be blown. Okay. The second one fault is for this type of Zener barrier where you're having two Zener barriers. So as I said, if one Zener barrier is gone, then the other one takes it up. Okay, so that is the second fault. The first fault could be because of your short circuit over here causing the current to increase or the voltage over here due to some uh, thing in your uh, accommodation side, the voltage has increased. And the second fault is any one of these barriers have gone coupled. Okay, that is the two fault, two circuit faults. EXIB, where there is only one circuit fault. That means instead of having two Zener barriers, uh, two Zener diodes, you'll be having only one Zener diode. <coughs> okay. So when it's working properly, then it will limit the voltage and the current. So that is one fault. But if that Zener diode goes faulty, then you will not have any uh, voltage uh, going into your particular thing. Your sensor is totally cut off. So one or the two, either the Zener diode is working properly or the Zener diode is gone coupled. If it is working properly, then you will get your voltage and your current limited. Okay, and if the Zener diode is gone, then you will not have that at all. Okay, so there in the second case, it is only when you're having one Zener diode as the thing that is going to be working. Okay. Is that clear? Okay, you can take a screenshot. I hope you've taken a screenshot of this. You can take a screenshot of the notes. Okay, they ask you sometimes in the orals. Zeners may have one or two or three Zener connections. Why are we having even two Zeners? We can have one. The reason is what I gave you just now. If it is having two Zener barriers, then you can have up to two circuit faults. Only one Zener barrier, then only one circuit So the more the Zeners, if you're going to have a third Zener, well and good, because the more Zeners that are there, <coughs> you'll be having even better protection, okay? Okay, so this one is just for your information that if you're having power lines and signal lines uh, traveling on board your ship, they are never sent through the same conduit pipe for the simple reason that your power lines will be having a stronger electromagnetic lines of force that are thing surrounding it. And the Stronger electromagnetic lines of force are obviously going to induce a voltage in the signal lines. It will cause interference and by causing interference, you will get wrong results. Okay, so they will generally be found in two separate conduit pipes. Power lines in one and the signal lines in the other. This will generally, <coughs> you 
you will generally find on board ship two different conduit pipes. I show where there's a lot of place and all that uh, you have no space constrictions, then they can have it at 90 degrees to each other, whereby the lines, the, the fields will cancel out each other. Okay, so tomorrow we will be seeing the video of your highest barrier. Let me see how many minutes it is. Just give me a moment. Okay. That's a pretty long video. So we'll see the intrinsically safe uh, video tomorrow and then we should continue and possibly complete this chapter also tomorrow okay so we'll call a halt for today's class over here and we'll continue and possibly as i said uh, finish this chapter tomorrow thank you very much for joining thank you sir thank you sir